Hey guys, Stealth here and welcome to Rule the Waves 3. In this video we're going to have a look at this new naval game. It is a successor to Rule the Waves 2. Rule the Waves 2 ended, and I believe, in World War II-ish. Uh, Rule the Waves 3 has a later time span. It ends in 1970. So it goes from ironclads to missile cruisers, as the game itself indicates. Now, one thing that I'm going to get right out of the way is uh, why is this video getting uh, black bars on top and below? Uh, well, the game doesn't run full screen. And that brings me to the very first point about this game. It's not for me. It's um, a very, very, very in-depth game. But it looks like I'm playing Excel. Like I'm playing a spreadsheet game. Much more so than Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts, for example. I mean, Dreadnoughts has a ton of flaws, but it does have good graphics, and this game does not. So if you care about a naval game that gives you all sorts of uh, visual goodies about the graphics, then I'm afraid this game, at least the strategy layer, is not for you. So what do we have in this game? Um, tons and tons and tons of info. Over on the top we have a couple of buttons, a couple of tabs. Overall we got the map, and the map is divided into a whole bunch of different theaters. That's these different squares. Now, you can have different ships in different theaters, and if you have a click on one of these theaters, you're going to see how much foreign station tonnage you have, um, adjacent areas, so where ships can move to, the minimum strength to blockade it, must be 110% over enemy strength, and the ship details, if you so have any. In this playthrough, I am playing as the French, so my navy is over here in Northern Europe and in some of my colonies. This screen is going to give you all the ships that you currently have in service. Um, this is more diverse than Dreadnoughts. And you can build aircraft carriers, you can even build aircraft carrier tenders. You have a lot of flexibility in this game. Ships under construction allow you, especially in tandem with the button over here, to build new ships. You get to design them. And designing new ships, good lord. Um, Dreadnoughts is... I think visually a lot more appealing and easier to work with. This seems far more in depth. Because going from the top to the bottom we have uh, what sort of ship are you looking to build? Are you going for a Dreadnought battleship? Or are you going for a Corvette? A seaplane carrier? An aircraft carrier? A light aircraft carrier? Uh, an armed merchant cruiser? Yes, that's a thing. You can build your own armed merchantman and pretend that you're this normal transport cargo ship when eventually you open fire. So let's say I want to be building a Dreadnought class battleship. You can give a name, you can develop by, so this looks like you can exchange ship files, and you can also have the AI design ship files for you. So if you don't want to build this thing yourself, you don't have to. You can let the AI do it. Displacement, uh, how much freeboard do you want, how fast is it supposed to go, and how far is it supposed to go? If you are an empire with colonies, then you might want to have a ship that can go to extreme ranges. But beware, uh, bringing all that fuel is going to cost you in the sense of displacement as well as actual money. Then, engine priority. Um, do you want your engines to be very reliable? Do you want to go fast? What sort of propulsion do you need? Uh, are we going to go for coal or all the way up to gas turbines? Coal, of course, being quite a bit cheaper than gas turbines. Now, belt armor, um, belt coverage, how much armor do you want to wear? How much do you want on the extended belt, the deck extender, the conning tower? you got a lot of different options. Now, keep in mind, this is a 19... I'm not even sure which era I'm currently in. Um, July 1935. So, when you're eventually going to be designing a ship that is suitable for missile air attack, so let's say 1955, then your entire screen here is going to change, because you might still have belt armor, but it could be a lot less interesting than you used to have. You can also pick your armor scheme, you can decide how much torpedo defense you want, how many crew members you want, so how good your accommodation is going to be. And that's just, let's say, the ship itself. Then you gotta move on to a bunch of weapon systems. Uh, what caliber of gun do you want on your ship? You can go all the way up to 20 caliber inch. Oh, sorry, 20 inch guns. You can add turrets, delete turrets. Uh, you can set how many rounds you want to carry per gun. So let's say I want to have uh, a couple of 12 inch guns. 
I'm going to have those in the forward and uh, amidships and aft position. Let's also bring a B turret. So let's say an A, B, and just maybe make an A, B, X, Y format as usual. One turret per position. The weight is going to be 134, 151, 45, 134. And I want to have, uh, let's say, 150 rounds per shell or uh, per gun. Then, how do you want the fire control? Uh, this is going to be, again, a lot of different options to pick from. So you can get the exact ship that you like. Turret era. Are you looking for Victorian turrets? Or are you looking for late Dreadnought era turrets? You have so many options. And, and this is something Dreadnoughts does not have. Medium and light anti-aircraft guns, because yes, aircraft carriers are a thing, and yes, they will come for you. So bringing some anti-air is probably going to be quite valuable, especially as you go on to the later eras. Now, then you also have secondary guns. You again have the turret era, even tertiary guns. So you can get a ton of different weapon systems onto a ship. And of course, you can refit them. So maybe your battleship from the 1920s lives all the way to 1935, 1940. And that's when the aircraft carriers or aircraft in general become a bit more prevalent. And you go, you know what? I would like to have my ship with a bunch of anti-air guns now. Otherwise, I might not live through the next attack. So all of these things can get upgraded. And you can even see that Seawiz, Close-In Weapon System and Radar uh, DIR. So I think Radar Direction or Radar Director... Uh, are currently grayed out. I haven't researched those yet. You can get additional armaments in the form of torpedoes, mines warfare, um, anti-submarine weapons, radar and electronics. I don't have that because I don't have any radar tech. Flight installations. Uh, you can add a catapult to a ship like this. Would that work? Um, I don't know. Maybe. I suppose you could use it as um, a seaplane slash helicopter hangar. And then make sure that you have like two aircraft with you so that you can do some spotting for yourself. Later on, you'll be able to add missile launchers and all of these are going to have to be researched because currently I haven't invented ship mounted missiles yet. Once you have that thing built, you can actually, or once you have it designed, you can actually start building it, which will take a while. And of course, you got to design them first, but you can build more. You can build submarines, forts. You can do uh, research in all sorts of different categories. And as time moves on, you'll be able to research additional things. Now, again, the game has a massive amount of depth. But what turns me off is just the, the spreadsheet nature of it. And that's something that makes me not want to play this game. Because, yes, it might be very, very, very deep. But it's so much, let's say, so much text and so little eye candy. That is just not for me. Doctrine. Um, how do you want your Navy to fight? What do you want to focus on? Do you want to go for piloting? Uh, do you want to use diving missiles? Again, you're going to have to research that. What type of oxygen or what type of propulsion do you want for your torpedoes? And um, when your target is a capital ship, what do you want to be firing at it? If it's 11-inch guns, you're going to be firing armor piercing. But if it's well, let's say a four to six inch gun um, at long range. You're probably not going to do much with armor piercing, but HE might do the trick. So all of these things are going to get taken into account when you actually go into battle. This can be set up for battle cruisers, uh, battleships and targets such as heavy cruisers and light cruisers. Destroyers apparently don't warrant any special attention. Air groups. I even have those. Now, if you get dumped into a 1935 campaign like I did, then you're going to have a lot of weapons and ships and planes that you inherit. So you're probably going to be spending like a half hour to an hour just figuring out where are my assets? Where is everything? What do I have? And what type of stuff do I have? What type of ships? What type of aircraft? Now you cannot design new aircraft, so you're going to have to do research into that in the sense that you do uh, naval aviation lighter than air, which is going to give you airship. Or you're going to be able to get uh, heavier than air. Night air operations is the last research. You can prioritize these. You can deprioritize them, again, to suit your fancy. You can also research better naval guns. Um, interestingly, I have researched 13-inch guns and 15s, but 14s we just skipped over. We don't have any 14-inch guns, so we're going to have to make do without those. Then, messages. What happened in the last turn? 
do you want to mobilize? This will activate all ships in reserve and mothballed. Uh, no, thank you. I don't need to. You can send all to the reserve. So that's the opposite of the mobilization. You can create divisions of ships, making sure that you have task forces. You can set fleet exercises and send ships on exercises and even divide up who is fighting whom. What sort of ships do you want to have fighting? What kind? Um, this is going to give your ships a bit more experience. Again, preferences. Um, this is mostly about the gameplay. How do you want to have the game handle itself? Ships under construction. What are you building? What submarines do you have? Can you design a submarine? Uh, I believe you cannot. You cannot design a submarine. You can, divide, you can design uh, surface warfare ships, but you cannot design submarines. You can, however, build submarines, but much like Dreadnought, they're divided into coastals, medium, uh, mine laying, and long range submarines. So in that sense, you do have options, yes, but potentially not as many as you would like. Another interesting feature of Rule of Waves is the coastal fortifications. You're able to not only uh, inherit these things, but also build them. And keep in mind that naval air stations are also part of coastal fortifications. Early game, um, and that is like say 1900s, building a couple of forts or bases in strategic positions might very well help you defend the place. It might very well, in the case of the French, if I zoom in on the... How do I do that? No, thank you. Here. Uh, if I zoom in on the French theater, if you design a couple, or if you place down a couple of uh, bunkers near Dunkirk, that might very well help you. Now, when it comes to building a fort, mm, let's say I want to have these in Western France, you cannot exactly specify where you want them. You can say how many you want, and you can say what type you want. And let's say I want to have uh, a 10 inch coastal, or a little bit, yeah, let's say a 10 inch coastal battery, and we'll have two of them. And the game goes, okay, we'll build those. I just don't exactly know where. Keep in mind, every bit of funding is going to get tracked. So your yearly budgets divided into a monthly budget. You're going to be spending on maintenance, construction, you're going to be doing research. You might want to do some extra training, that's the fleet exercises. And you're going to have some expenses, uh, uh, adding up to a grand total of, in my case, 10k. So I'm burning money at an alarming rate, and that also has to do with me just building a couple of forts. Can you get additional money? Uh, probably, I just haven't worked out how yet. Ships sunk or scrapped, I had to save a bit of money, and these things seemed fairly old. Um, I'm not even sure what an AV is. Seaplane carrier, okay. So I scrapped a seaplane carrier and a destroyer. The area overview is a very quick overview of where your assets are. So in Northern Europe is where I have most of my ships or at least my base capacity. This is where I'm most of my tonnage. I do have some in the South Pacific, some in Southeast Asia, just making sure that the colonies stay in line. Base overview, where are your bases? What do they do? What do they have? And again, you're, <laughs> it's just numbers. It's just numbers, um, which turns me off from this game. Your officers, and this is a part I do like, your officers are stationed aboard ships and um, you have different ranks. I have Capitan de Vaisseau uh, Rosier. This guy is uh, apparently above average. He has no special abilities, but that might develop later on. He's currently the commanding officer of the Marengo, Battleship uh, Devastation, or Devastation, considering it's French. Commanded by uh, Von Stable. No known ability or disability of any kind. So all of these things, they do add quite a bit of character to your ships, which is something that in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts, I would say is missing. Because you just got the ship with, let's say, the unique name. Uh, but that's about it. That's about all the story you get. Here, you can definitely make up your own backstory with all of these officers and all of their names and, uh, I don't know, Captain Varney uh, messed up by running the ocean into the ground. Yes, that's a weird sentence. And I demoted him to take command of a destroyer. I don't know. You can create something like that. You can come up with funny stories if you will. At some point, you will be fighting the enemy, of course. Now, in this case, I have a bunch of nice bars over here. The tension with Germany is four. I don't know if that's high or low. 
all I can see is that the relations currently are all green. So nobody's fighting anybody. Uh, the tension between Japan and the British is five. The tension between Japan and the Russians, I guess, is six. So, um, yeah, Soviet Union. So these guys are more likely to fight. And if you do play a turn, you're going to get a pop-up every now and then that says, hey, this stuff happened. The British have created a new destroyer. The US have created a new destroyer. Um, the swale has been commissioned by the British. The Italians have commissioned another destroyer. And the uh, Zuiho reportedly been commissioned in 17 months. So you can also figure out what sort of other ships the enemy might have coming up. As opposed to just going, boom, they've been commissioned. Now, I'm not sure if this is tied into my ability to get intel on them. Because with these plus and minus uh, symbols, you can easily attribute how much you want to research on these guys, how much intel you want to get on them. But it is not free. Intelligence over here on the expenses menu does make your money go down faster. So you might have a lot of intel on Germany. Is that going to help you? I don't know. The Almanac is going to show you exactly how many ships each nation has. How much naval budget they have. Uh, in my case, my yearly budget is 106k. Compare that to Germany, um, it is not very high. The Germans have about 50% more. And their tech level is supposedly very advanced. Same as Britain. Uh, the Italians are behind. The Japanese are behind, interestingly. US is very advanced. The Chinese are backward. <laughs> That's a bit of an insult to China and Spain. Apparently their naval capacity, uh, the naval tech is quite low. Which I suppose would make them an interesting challenge to play in the campaign. Now, um, overall, do I recommend the game? I find that very difficult to answer. In my personal preference, I would skip this. Because it is just... It's just too much Excel. It's too much number crunching, going from menu to menu to menu without really, I don't know, seeing my ships in action, much like I would in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts. And like I said, that game has a ton of flaws, but it does do that quite well. If you are very interested in going highly into depth with all of these ships and making your battleship or your corvette or what have you exactly the way that you want, then this is probably an excellent game for you. Just know that um, you're going to have to do quite a bit of learning, quite a number or quite a learning curve to figure out where everything is, what all the buttons do. But if you're coming from uh, Rule the Waves 2, this should probably feel right at home. So I hope this quick overview helped you guys. Let me know what your thoughts are on Rule the Waves 3 down below in the comments. And I look forward to seeing what your thoughts are on Rule the Waves. Link down below in the description in case you want to go over to Steam and buy the game for yourself. And, uh, well, again, I'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching. See you soon for more.